ordinance. Women have faced honor crimes where crimes against their human integrity and human security are considered private crimes and civil law offenses rather than a crime against the public under the Hudud Ordinance. And thirdly, blasphemy crimes, where under the penal code in Pakistan, even an innuendo against the Quran constitutes an act of criminal liability, and victims face the death sentence. And you worked on these three areas um, with your clients, but also at a on a larger platform, trying to change those laws and trying to change those policies, and both in the court as well as outside the court, in what you have created that was not in Pakistan before, a women's action forum, bringing together the women of Pakistan to protest against crimes against their names. So I want you to speak um, of those stories, beginning with Salmat Mashi's crime, where this 14-year-old young boy faced the death sentence for uh, allegedly um, desecrating the name of the prophet when he was only 14 and illiterate. His uncle was murdered in court, and the Christian pastor who supported the family shot himself in protest. And the judge who ruled on this case was shot and murdered. So as you can see, there has been a spurt of murders in the name of the blasphemy laws. So starting with the blasphemy laws, I want you to tell our audience and the, the students and the graduates of Penn Law and their families those stories of struggle and resistance. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I must thank all of you for allowing me to be here. It's a great opportunity for me. And despite what Rangita says, I can assure you that my work is not that dreadful and boring. Uh, what I do comes very natural to me. And Pakistan, despite its horror story, also has many aspects to it where there are challenges that are made from within society. And these challenges are made despite risk. There are a number of people who stand by you. And the fact that Salim and his family is here, it's like an extended family for me. Everybody that I work with, everyone who comes to your hour of need. And I just because he's here, I want to say that in our office, there was a murder of a girl. And when I ran up the stairs, I saw that there was two dead bodies first, one dead body lying on the staircase. And I had to, he gave me his hand, and I skipped over it. And I was a bit teary, and I was crying. And so he said to me, you mustn't cry. If you start crying, what will happen to the rest of the office? They will break away. So take hold of yourself. And I immediately wiped off my tears, and I said, yes, I think you're right. We have to take hold of ourselves. But let me say that something that Rangita didn't find out, despite her very impressive 200 pages research, was my absolute link to the law of blasphemy. And this is a story I must tell you. Many years ago, in the Women's Action Forum, there was a debate whether a woman's testimony should be half that of a man or not, or whether Ziaul Haq's laws were indeed Islamic or not. So they had a seminar in which I was also invited, along with the Chief Justice of the Federal Chariot Court and the Islamic advisor to the President, Ziaul Haq. And I don't know why they made me sit there on the platform with them knowing my views quite well about religion, because I'm a very a-religious person. Uh, and I always say to people that there are many kinds of Muslims, you know, happy-go-lucky Muslims, stout Muslims, conservative Muslims, radical Muslims, dangerous Muslims. So I consider myself one of those happy-go-lucky Muslims. Uh, but anyway, while this debate was going on, I also realized that I was already tipped off 
that there is some intelligence officers in the room, and no matter what happens, I am going to get into trouble today. And while the debate was going on, I sort of said, look, why do you need us to interpret Islam for you to the audience? The fact is that you can interpret it yourself. You can read the Quran yourself, and you can interpret it yourself the way you wish.